you everyone for uh, coming. Uh, my name is Bilal Tanvir. I am the co-director for the Romani Center for Languages and the Teacher. And we have this distinct pleasure of hosting this uh, film screening. Uh, I've known Hira for many years now. Uh, we were peers at LAPS. Uh, Hira was one year, two years, or two years. Yeah. Yeah. What? Yeah. Never felt like <laughs> <that>. <laughs> <laughs> Never felt like <laughs> Um, and, and you know, I mean, again, uh, Pena and I have been in touch over the years and, you know, seeing her work, uh, seeing her transition, uh, and, and I think that it's, it's, it's particularly exciting for me to have been at her and show her work. Um, and thank you so much, Hira, for being to come and, uh, you know, have this, uh, for having the screening. Our equipment, I hope, is up to par. We kind of search around lungs looking for the right auditorium which would have the right kind of projector and right kind of uh, sound for this kind of screening. Um, so thank you so much. Uh, this film obviously as I think all of you know has traveled the world, uh, has <coughs> gone through several festivals um, and, and I'm very happy that it is here now. Uh, I also want to thank everyone involved in, in making this event possible. Um, you know, our, uh, Manu is here. Manu is here. Manur has done all the work of making, you know, putting in this, this, all of these things in place, um, as well as Arusa Sumani is our coordinator. The club basically handles everything uh, with regards to, you know, all our work um, that is, has to do with, for example, uh, bringing and running around, and especially there is tea afterwards, so the club is also will be hosting that. Uh, I want to thank some of Dr. Sabha Pizade who agreed to host uh, this uh, screening. Uh, Dr. Sabha's specialization is eco-criticism, but she works in a very uh, diversity of areas um, and relating to South Asian literature, uh, South Asian and the foreign literature. Thank you so much, Sabha. And thank you so much, Kira, for <laughs> for that very kind invitation and thank you for coming for what promises to be a very exciting event. It is my pleasure to introduce uh, Hira Nabi to you before we see the films. Um, Hira is a filmmaker, multimedia artist and researcher. Her work looks at repressed memory in urban landscapes, imagined histories and possible futures, migrations, botanical exchanges, infrastructure and the environment. Her work has been exhibited and screened <coughs> at various very prestigious international forums. So clearly, you know, she, she does the level of representing us nationally, internationally, which is wonderful. And Hira earned her BA in video and post-colonial studies from Hampshire College in 2010, and an MA in cinema and media studies from the New School in 2016. So we're going to see two films uh, that Hira's directed today. Uh, one, the first one will be All That Perishes at the Edge of Land, and the second one is The Return. Um, Hira will briefly introduce the films to you, and then we can open this up for it. Uh, for Hi everybody, thanks so much for coming. I know it's a crazy day with William and Kate in town, so I appreciate <laughs> that you all the like, brave traffic to be here. Um, this was mainly an event supposed to where I was going to screen my film All That Parishes at the Edge of the Land, which is um, set at the Garani Shabriki Yard. But I also thought to maybe introduce you a bit more to the kind of work that I've been doing for the past few years. So I'm going to screen a short before that, which is um, which is a narrative short, and that's set in the Cuban countryside. So we'll see both films back to back, and then also hopefully um, by the end of this, maybe like one of the key cast members, Shahzad Alam, will also join us for a discussion. I'm going to start us off by what I see as somewhat of a linkage between the two films. I found it interesting that you look at in both films this is idea of these desolate landscapes and these marginalized kind of human beings. So is that a topic you kind of gravitated towards in both? And what do you feel is kind of the difference in representing them in documentary versus fiction? Wow. <laughs> it really like starting to rely. Um, <laughs> no, it's interesting because I I didn't think of it so much as like these desolate landscapes. Um, I think that there's a lot of richness in them, there's a lot of beauty in them. Sure. Like struggled or like I was, it was not even so much of a struggle, but it was nice to find that. But I was very um, interested in like pursuing questions or like ideas or visuals of dystopia. Okay. Um, so 
I, uh, I, I mean, as the world around us falls apart, we sort of see that. And I think in my art, I wanted to try and represent that in some way, try and speak to that in some way. I mean, I realized that I was moving towards these dark places. Um, but that to me was really kind of a, a, of a reflection of where we're, sort of where we're headed towards. That, yeah, that makes sense. I think the story is something we all kind of struggle with and find ourselves but what you said about like if there's a difference between narrativizing something mm -hmm. or like documenting something, I mean I come from like I don't come from a doc background at all. Like documentary mm -hmm. was something that I never really did. I I mean I'm interested in using the camera as like a form of witnessing, as like thinking about archiving spaces mm -hmm. and time. Um, I was always in, I mean I came to cinema because of stories. So I was interested in storytelling and that like lends a kind of like fictive. Uh, world to the sort of film that I wanted to be. Um, but so but at some point I think I switched more into I want people to maybe just like talk tell their own narratives and tell their own stories and that then becomes in some ways more harsh or more intense uh, or just more crazy than actually fiction. Like is that part I mean people talk about it a lot where like how oh wow like the real like real life is stranger than fiction. Yes. And I find that it then kind of so like finding this way to uh, hybridize both became like a sort of became a kind of artistic uh, mechanism that I want more not to do. Very good. You also like Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so I've, uh, I'm so delighted today to have somebody from who's been a part of the film in in a, in a removed sense because you were never at Galani. But you're the voice of the ship, you're the voice of Ocean Master. So, it, and you know, I mean, everywhere I go with this film, everybody is so curious about who the voice of the ship is. And they're really like entranced by this voice. So it's so, uh, it's so nice for me to have Sherida here today, uh, who is voicing Ocean Master. And I'm sure, I mean, I'm sure people will have a lot to ask you, and maybe you also want to talk about what it was like to work on this together. <coughs> all pluses, all pluses, and even working with you here was a very, very interesting experience. Uh, I'm seeing the film for the first time on a large screen, <coughs> but I'm so overwhelmed. I've seen it on a small, but when you see it on a large screen, I mean, I knew your compositions, I, I knew a little bit about this film, but when you see it in size, properly, it's really magnificent. <coughs> so great and also the, the voices are amazing and very deep and they hit you and it's a sort of marvelous film. Don't you think? <laughs> yeah, yes. <laughs> and the framing uh, of almost each shot and also just showing the people in their real lives and, uh, and I, I don't know how you photograph I mean it, I will like it was a I mean I was working on it for a year oh. and for that long time um, and I think something that I, this is also something that comes up about like how much time we spent there. Um, for me, it was really important to keep going back. Uh, and I found that the space opened up more and more every time I would go back. It was also, I mean, it was funny because they're, they're used to cameras. Every time there's an explosion or an accident or a strike, yes. there will be like news media from Karachi that immediately come to cover it. So I remember being asked, Acha, when are we going to see this? And will it be on the 7 o'clock news or something? And I would say, no, it's a film. Like, it's not going to be on the news. But that distinction between what a film is and what a, like, what a news camera person is was like, not really there. But then the fifth time that I showed up, it was like, OK, you're back again. So you okay, know, let's chat. Like, no, this is something else that's happening. So it was nice to, or like, I mean, it was nice to build that relationship, but then to also see them go through like different seasons, people would leave, people would come back, 
they would like deal with employment, unemployment, like just so much. And did you feel that left kind of an affective impact on you when you left that place? Eventually, you know, you found these bonds with people, you yeah. left the bonds with people. So did you feel that carried with you? In some way, they were not really Yeah, like I really think that also the last day of the shoot was super intense because we conducted a lot of interviews on that day. And I mean, and that's a day when like two different people in like two separate interviews broke down. And so there was just a lot of, there was a lot of emotion at that time. And it was super intense. And I remember kind of thinking, because the word Majbudi just kept coming up all the time. Like it was something that they would talk about, like, you know, Majbudi ki wajah se ya iski Majbudi, ya wo Majbudi. And everything was, so, and it wasn't, it wasn't just helplessness, it was also desperation. It was also really like a lot of struggle to push to like the complete end of your limits and having no security and then having to like just carry on, carry on, carry on because you had to. So there was, I mean, that to like, so I went back and I left with that and then I had to take a break mm -hmm. from the film because I realized like I was too involved in it. So, so then I left it for like a bit and then I came back to it to try and give myself some distance. Because I was also editing it myself, so it was like, okay, I need to step out and then I need to go back in. Um, but yeah. Because you get invested at some point beyond yeah. this right? Yeah. So, people. so uh, I'm sure the audience has a lot of questions too, so we can open it up and start. So, I think they, particular character was in the interesting space. We don't really see faces, no. Like in the beginning, we see some, we see like pain face, um, and so that kind of comes out of like one an artistic choice where I'm not very interested in talking heads at all, and two there were some people that weren't comfortable, some people were, and three which really was like the most important reason was that I wanted to universalize the music. and I wanted to for it to not just be like one person's story or two people's stories because there's really you hear two or three voices very strongly, but I felt that that was the experience of so many people across the board. So I wanted to find a way to convey that and to also really like give you a sense of how the workers become super invisible in this like infrastructural industry where you see the work they do but you never see them. And I kind of wanted to push that further and so that's why we don't see that. Like when you see yeah, thank you very much. Um, I was reminded also were you aware of a film uh, called uh, Iron Eater as a first set yeah. in Bangladesh, uh, which was done by German Bangladesh. You had seen this before? I haven't seen it. I've heard of it. I've like written to me. Um, it's by a, this guy called Shah. Shaheen Del Riaz. Yeah. So I can link you if you want. That would be great. Do you want to have a hand up? Oh yeah. So most of the most of okay. the mazdoors. Oh sorry. Sorry. Did you have a question? Okay. Oh. <laughs> um, if you look at, um, I, I was wondering how much you were in the way you were representing these voices and both the shit as well as the uh, workers. How much you were inspired actually by kind of contemporary social theory? Because I could clearly see in the workers this kind of um, subordinate consciousness that the means of production will always belong to someone else. Right. There's one thing that we have a kind of working class consciousness that is not uh, in that sense organized or united, but there's a sense of that in a sense that one won't kind of uh, win over or desperation as you said. And the second one is this uh, whole ontological term obsession with uh, Let's say the world is in shambles and in rubbles and the industry and, and the world is in collapse and, and now out of these rubbles something new is generated. So I've seen this in both um, films and then in, in this whole narratives is also the ship or and uh, in this ontological term, things and animals and the environment, everything becomes gets an agency and becomes like an, an actor and I found this very interesting also in the way it is the ship here. So it's just one way as an academic how kind of your own studies were influenced in this representation of Yeah. Um, I mean, 
Well, the workers are organized in a sense because there is a union. And so the union kind of like getting to know the union workers was really like my way of accessing the yard. Uh, this is also the third attempt to form a union because there was very previous like union busting um, that the yard owners employed. But after this big explosion, I think they realized, okay, it's maybe best to work with the union to avoid the, like uh, more press and just like kind of like for the lawsuit damages or something. So this like, I mean, I think there's one person really who has like a strong sense of like himself as like a political worker or like himself as like a political agent or the fact that he's really aware of his identity as a worker. The one who dehumanizes himself I think and like locates his identity primarily as a worker. He's been with the union for a long time. He's also old. He's been at the yard for about 40 years. So he's seen a lot and um, I mean I was blown away really by his articulation of how he found conditions there. And so to my mind it was also interesting because he also says at some point that okay, we are illiterate and we can't dream of much or we don't know much. It was like you actually have such an astute understanding of power, it's incredible. Um, so so I didn't have to really feed anybody anything. Like it was they had a very strong sense of who, what they were doing, like who controlled things. Um, at the time of making this, I was reading Rob Nixon's book, So Violence and an Environmentalism of the Poor, which really, I think, um, impacted how I viewed this film. Because uh, violence, when you think about it, I mean, immediately we start thinking of acts of terrorism, or we think of something like violence as a spectacle. But I was less interested in that. I was more interested in violence as like something prolonged and very slow. So what does it mean, for instance, that like somebody's, at, or somebody's on the yard working there for maybe a few weeks, but while they're working, they're breaking down the roofs and they're inhaling asbestos. They leave the yard, they go and they work you know, on their land, because a lot of them are migrants. They're coming from the north, they're coming from Hill and so on. And say like six years later, you discover you have asbestosis and your lungs have completely disintegrated. But that's not a workplace accident. So how do you hold, like, who do you hold accountable? So for me, the kind of theory or like the sort of aesthetic I wanted to work around and think more through, think more thoroughly through was this like slowness and the long theory of violence. I think you had some other questions, but maybe like really <laughs> okay. Yeah, my question was more about the where the, whether they were migrant workers or more the local population because it seemed like they were not from there like they all kept mentioning that oh, you know are elsewhere and, and um, so what do the people who are from there do are they mostly doing this or are they involved in other work or there are not a lot of balocha there they don't like they maybe don't work on they're not working on the ships they may be doing other work on the yard but mostly like the laborers are like they're coming from Swat, they're coming from the coast. Um, which is also like an interesting kind of, if you think about the, like about ethnically, if you think about labor in Pakistan, if you think about like being indentured or you think about migrations, like it is a lot of people traveling from the north, which then makes you think about like how the state has failed people upwards of Rawalpindi or like yeah. Islamabad or like what kind of, um, what kind of opportunities exist or don't exist there. <coughs> Uh, some of the, like one person I remember talking to who was Baloch, he said something about like how his ancestors were all fisher folk. Mm -hmm. So that they were fishermen and Gadani also used to be a fishing village. Mm -hmm. uh, but then because of the contamination and the pollution of the water, like the, I mean, because those launch boats, they can't, they can't fish with those because those you can only fish around the shore. Like if you take them further out, they capsize. So that whole industry has kind of died out yeah. or it's like shifted. Kind of further down. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Sorry, go. Uh, concerning that this ship breaking industry is probably all privately owned, right? If I'm not wrong. So, you had to go there and showcase the concern of the workers and everything. So, how much of a problem did you face from the owners of the industries? Did you ever? I mean, like, they knew I was there. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't film this with permits, so exactly. was like, uh, I mean, I don't know, like it's funny because I think I was being Herzogian without really being Herzogian, but Herzog always talks about how it's like, 
you know, you film first and you deal with like the consequences <laughs> later. Like I'll apologize later, but I'm not going to ask permission. So it's kind of like that. I was like, if I get into permissions, then maybe this will never happen. But the union was really my biggest access point because at all times I was never alone there. There was always somebody who was a union worker, with me. Okay. and so they would be like uh, anybody who would come up to me, like they would be deferred directly to them. I mean, once uh, there was a, I was there at uh, there was an active site, and they were kind of bringing down a really big piece, and so there was this like they connected it with these bunches, but I think there was some miscalculation about how much weight they needed to apply. So there's like a big wire running and uh, everybody's like, okay, get back, get back. And I was like, my camera's there, okay, but get back. That wire broke and luckily, like it went into the sea. If it went the other way, like it's chopped off like people's ankles and stuff. So, so but the owner wasn't there. They were on the, he was on the phone with the supervisor. So he, like the supervisor then the Jamadar like tells him, yeah, okay, there's been an act, like there's been a, like it's broken, so we have to fix it, we need to repair it. So he immediately asks, oh, were there any accidents? And he's like, no. And he's like, okay, you know that girl who's swimming, like that woman, get her out. Okay. So they, then they were like, you have to leave. So it was this sort of, you know, I had to like negotiate things like that. But by and large, I mean, I worked with a small crew, it was mostly myself. Like I didn't take a lot of people, so I could easily like sit under the radar. Are you able to show this? Yeah, that's my plan. So currently, um, because of uh, so the exchange rate is terrible, so there are no ships being bought, and there's really no work being done. So a lot of people have left. But I'm hoping maybe by December some work can continue. So I want to take it there to show it. There. Yeah. So you mean the people to go do the film the new work? None of them don't. Some are still there. Some have moved to Karachi to do some other work, but like that not people are not there. So until another project comes, yeah. then they may return. Yeah. Me. Yeah. Still me. Yeah. yeah that was also yeah. that was going to be my question. That yeah. I think it would be amazing to see it yeah. there. Because yeah. they've seen it in Karachi, but it's not the same. Like we did a screening at the Oyd Institute and then um, it was really kind of the director to like arrange for transport, and so some people came, but it was you know it's not the same as like being at Kadani and like watching it there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one is against the backdrop of the troops which are the vehicles as well, and you know, staying and direct the ship and the man at the same. They liked it, like they got into it, um, but. Like I, I mean, I want to screen. Like at that time, it wasn't finished, so we haven't seen this come out. Oh, sorry, did you have? <coughs> How did that start? I was wondering. Thank you very much. Uh, I was wondering that the workers who contributed had any education. Uh, were there any messages they wanted? So it was also like funny to make it with them because I would be interviewing them, but I would say, so can you imagine like I'm the ship? And so they look at me like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, look, it's the ship that's done. Like at some point we kind of got into this, like this is what the film is going to look like. Um, I sometimes did ask them, like I remember I had a question like, do you have any messages for your family? And they were like, no, I'll go home before this film is done. So, so it wasn't, but I remember that at some point when it was done, when they saw like a version of it at the Goethe Institute, they were speaking with um, Stefan, who's the director, and who's German, and so they, they, it was something like, well, can you tell Germany to stop sending these ships that are filled with asbestos and that are, like, have all this toxic material in them? So I think at some point they wanted to try to, like, uh, the union leader was very clear that, okay, this film is going to help us in some way. So I think that was sort of there, that this film is being made in a certain perspective that will be useful to us, so we can use it in the future as like documentation of this time, or like use it to like, as a kind of like bargaining tool, or even just to spread awareness. Um, something that I'm very keen on, for instance, is like, uh, is really to, to use this film as a way to try and ask for clean water to be pumped there because there's no clean water. So to start with something like clean use, but to, yeah, to start with that. That was not the only part. 
it is a demand. They have lots of demands. Um, I mean, that is a demand. Electricity is a demand. I think better wages are a demand. Having a hospital there is a demand. There is a lot of them. So, in fact, uh, if you look at their annual earnings, it comes, uh, you know, it uh, actually works out in such a way that they are uh, below the, uh, on average or below average. And I think there's a lot of study. Uh, Harold did superb work on this, I remember, and a lot of other people have done superb work as well. Is that um, if they if they had worked year round and then they were making that, and then then they would be much better off. That's not. Anything also what your film hinted at well was the invisibilized dangers. This is breaking a ship. Every day their corporeality is in threat of being destroyed, you know, they can get disabled at their job within like this time, minutes, right? Their bodies are getting poisoned. They're living isolated lives. What are the costs of that kind of living do, right? That's a very precarious existence. So not to nullify what other laborers do. But it's very exceptional and the dangers that they put in every day when they're breaking down these ships. So I think that's also should be Kind of taken into consideration and talk about you know the materiality of what they're working under, right? This is the worst kind of living conditions to be in. Um, Saul had a question. I did, but I think Leila Saiba had her hand up first, so I'll let you okay, go first. Sure. So, so the first, uh, I just wanted to know how far is the hostel or shack where they live from? This? I mean, do they pay for transport there no, they, as well? Or? They bike there, they walk there. Um, so it's not it's not that far. That land belongs to the Baloch government. So they pay like whoever the middleman is at that point that's negotiating. That's not that far. 
if you're working on a ship, then you have access to like two buckets of water. If you're not employed, then you can't access any water. So you have to then pay a tanker, or you have to pay like whatever. I mean, you have to find someone. I, I, sorry, so it, 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 like when you say they worked on a ship that's worth the time, then there's no other ship in the on the beach at that point, okay. and they go back to work on which is called back home. Uh, sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. Sometimes if it's like, okay, a ship is coming in in like a few weeks, then they'll stick around. Stay yeah, then they'll yeah. stay, they'll like, I mean, they use their savings. Mm -hmm. um, they will, you know, wait for, you know, like wait for something. If something comes up, then, you know, they'll take that on. Because then this, the travel costs yeah. from the Dani to the you know, from Zahar to the it's crazy. Mm -hmm. And from there, and the hours and days and conditions for people. Sabu. 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 Um, you know, that was uh, lovely, very powerful. Uh, so, it, so your the documentary obviously <coughs> conveys a deeper social message, but it's also showcasing your skills and an, as an artist. So I wanted to get a sense of what were the mechanics behind making the film, where to place the camera, how to capture certain kind of frames, etc. Like, and as you said, that this was the first time you, well, you recently gotten into cinema. So was this sort of on the job kind of learning, or where were you getting your inspiration from? And for budding filmmakers, if there are any in the audience, I guess. You know, we'd like to, oh, at least I'd like to, well, I'm not a budding filmmaker, I'm a boring <laughs> economist, but would like to hear your thoughts on you know, how, how, where does this inspiration really stem from? Um, well, I didn't recently get into cinema. I, I more recently became interested in documentary filmmaking. Uh, I, I mean, I'm a fan of CO cinema, mm. so, so that was definitely, um, something that I was thinking a lot about, like how like how does time operate in places, which is why it was also interesting to hear from a ship's perspective. Like what does time mean for a ship? Like what is what do dreams mean for a ship? But in terms of capturing that, I it was thinking a lot about of course the work being done and how much of like the uh, the work itself I could access. So like where was the one thing happening, I could access that I couldn't get on a ship. Because after this accident, uh, just they were a lot more strict about what you could and couldn't access as a visitor. So that's where I have to kind of bring in somebody to use a door. But it was also like it was interesting to work with other people in that sense because what I wanted was not necessarily something that was always given to me. Like I was working with people that mainly made ads. So I would say, okay, like I really like I want you to just keep the camera in one place and not move. But at some point they're like training wood kicking, so it was like chuk, 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 chuk. and I was like, no, like no, 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 it's like really not. So, so there was a lot of learning that I had to do, or like relearning, where I was like, okay, I need to trust myself. Like I may not have the fanciest equipment, I may not have the best lenses, but I know that I know what I want, and so I'm just gonna kind of go out there, spend time in the lab, and capture things. Um, I think when it comes to inspiration. I really like Abbas Kiarostami's work. Um, I also like Lucretia Martel's work a lot. Um, I like Haneke's work a lot. This work is like there's a lot of static camera. Like, so the camera is just placed in like at one place on a tripod. People are walking in and out, and you just let them. I mean, you let the people then become used to the camera. So I like that method because it allows for people that I'm filming to become very comfortable. So it was funny to me when like I had this camera assistant and he's kind of like he's saying, Acha, ye camera mina likhe, and which is something that I would never say, but then I was like, okay, I'm just gonna let this interaction happen and they're like, yeah, yeah, whatever. Like, you know, we're so used to people coming and filming us and interviewing us like we know. So so we had those kind of funny moments like that. Are there any other questions? I wanted to say that there must have been a, a core group of people who kind of understood what you meant from that. Do you think there was three or four? Yeah, 
I think so. I think that the people, I think some of the Indian members that I was interacting with a lot, like that I would see every time. And they had also seen the ashes. Oh. So they were kind of like, okay, you know, so they, they, they leave it, get what you're doing, uh. and we're excited about it. Okay. Or then we see where it goes. But, um, but we sort of understand that you're not going to use this. Yeah. It's something else, it's something different. <coughs> So they were really cooperating after they understood that you weren't anything negative. Then yeah. they could yeah. they just yeah, I think trust you and then yeah. walked along you know, with you. Yeah, which was incredible. Very incredible for you to that making this film, of course, was one experience. But then the way it must have grown, uh, meaning uh, always things are bigger than what you think. Much more to the film that you thought is there once you start making it. That you know it expands in the middle of the project, the project starts to expand, and you're part of it. Then those are very exciting moments, and you can't stop. I mean, there's just you have to keep going. I mean, even with us, like I came, recorded, and there's always, oh no, there's this, and then you know, somebody outside, or there's these jiggles, or there's that. and at my age and really enjoy it and there was a resonance in everything I was saying it meant something, it wasn't just saying it. So it was very exciting for me because of that I didn't think I should be made good but uh, I thought let's give it a try. <laughs>